Hello everyone, this is Caleb Simpson, and you are watching my walkthrough for Chrono Trigger for Nintendo DS. This video covers the chapter titled The Time Egg, in which we are doing Chrono's side quest. So we have just completed the Ocean Palace and then confronted Magus here and did the whole Blackbird and everything. And so we confront Magus and now he is part of my party. This is what I decided to do. You can also fight him if you want to see how to do that, then refer to the previous video. Now that we have Magus in our party, one thing you can do that's real fun is you can go to the surviving village and there is Alphador, who is Magus's cat there. And remember that Alphador only likes Magus, or at least that was the case until he met this little kid anyways. But what's fun is if you have Magus in your party and you go to the village commons here in Surviving Village, you can then see that the cat will meow when he sees Magus. So regardless of if you decide to fight Magus or to have him as part of your party, he will give you the tip that you should go seek out Gasper, the Guru of Time, who might have a way to revive Chrono. Now the next time that you enter the epic, you weren't able to actually fly it after we completed the Blackbird. They said they wanted to look for a clue for Chrono. So now that we have that, get on the epic, and then you will see the Black Omen rise out of the depths of the sea. And I'm not, I guess this is supposed to be the Ocean Palace, even though inside the Black Omen later in the game is completely different than the Ocean Palace we already experienced, whatever. So this is a flying fortress that then comes out of the sea and materializes in the sky here in 12,000 BC. So now from now on, from 12,000 BC onward, you will see the Black Omen here in all time periods at this location. And um, what's interesting about that too is that all the characters comment on it, like um, we are the only ones that remember it not being there, but all the other characters in the game um, act as though the Black Omen has always been there. So from this point onwards, we have access to the Black Omen, which is the final area of the game. The last dungeon is the most difficult, most difficult Difficult enemies, some really sweet items and stuff there, and it also leads to the final boss of the game. Now that is a little bit weird because you can fight Lavos in many different locations and time periods depending on when you fight him throughout history. So that is just kind of an aside, but yes, yeah, so Black Omen is one of those options. However, there's a bunch of side quests and optional content that are available right now, including the Lost Sanctum, which is what you're seeing on screen right now. These portals appear in 65 million BC and 600 AD at this point, and that leads to the Lost Sanctum, which is kind of bonus content that is available for some versions of the game. I'm playing the DS remake. It's also available in the Steam version, and I I think a couple others. I'll talk more about that later on in the walkthrough, but for now we're just ignoring it. But um, right now there's a bunch of more side quests that are really important that lead to some really awesome, they're really awesome for storyline purposes, but also they lead to some really great items. And this one also leads to bringing Chrono back. So that's what we're trying to do for this, this particular side quest. That's what this whole video is all about, is how can we revive Chrono? So our first objective is to speak with the old man here in the end of time. Now, if you have Magus in your party, he actually has additional dialogue. That's a bonus that doesn't have with any other combinations. However, just so you know, this will only happen if you don't have Marl in your party, because if she's in the party at the same time, then it will prioritize her dialogue and Magus won't have his bonus text at all. So what you want to do is have any character combination, just don't have Marl in it. Now, regardless of which team composition you have initially, then the old man will then play this song titled Memories of Chrono, which is another one of my favorites from this game. Super nice little song. I really like, like, I don't know, doing dishes and whistling along with a song. It's like such a good song to like harmonize with and stuff. It's great. Um, anyways, so then the old man will then recognize Magus if you have him in your party, but you don't have Marl. And he explains that he seems that he recognizes Magus, but that Magus has changed over time and he has gotten more tainted and stuff like that, me implying that he knew Magus before he was Magus. In other words, when he was Janus. Now, if you remember too, when we were confronted Magus on the Cape, um, in the surviving village area in 12,000 BC, there was a brief cinematic where it showed what happened to all of the various gurus and Janus, how they warped to different time periods, and it showed Gasper, the guru of time, appearing in the end of time. So, pretty obvious if you're paying attention before now, too, that this is indeed Gasper, the guru of time. He's been here all along. We've been interacting with him. So I'll come back to that in a moment. So after you speak with Gasper the first time, you can then speak with all of your other characters, and they will then tell you, show you their reaction to Chrono's death. So you finally get to hear what everybody has to say at this point. I think this is super interesting that you're even able to do this. It's kind of like a lot of games when you have your main character, who the protagonist who doesn't speak at all, it's kind of like you don't really ever feel like they have much personality or anything, but this game's a little bit different. Not really so much because you learn about Crone as a character, but you learn about his influence on everybody else. And they're the characters we're interacting with that we're connected with anyway. So it's kind of just an interesting way of telling that story and I think it's pretty impressive. So I'm just walking around talking with all the various characters so you can see their reaction to Chrono's death. So now uh, going back to what I was saying a little bit ago, um, originally in the Chrono Trigger beta, there was uh, several things that were in existence that were plans that the that Square had 
but they eventually changed by the time they released the final product. So, in the Chrono Trigger beta, originally Gasper was going to be one of the playable characters. So the old man here was going to be one of the characters that we could have in our party that we could fight with. Now, we're not entirely sure on his abilities and stuff. Uh, uh, presumably, he was going to have some time magic, and he was going to be able to smack people with his cane, probably only when they were in melee range. Kind of similar to how Luca would smack people with her mallet when they're too close, and otherwise she shoots him with her blaster at range for her regular attack. So similarly, then uh, Gasper was going to have something kind of like that. So we don't really know much about that. I think a lot of those game files have actually been removed in the final version, so there isn't any remnants of that in the final version. So when people data mine it, they don't actually see that anymore. But just something interesting to know. So the next time you try to leave after you're done talking with everybody, then Gasper will call out to you and tell you to come back and speak with him. So once you do, though, he will then give you the Chrono Trigger. Now, as far as the most interesting team composition for this particular conversation, I feel like Magus, Ayla, and Marl are the most interesting here. They have the most uh, dialogue and show you the most the most things. I'm going to try and show the dialogue that has the most interesting or the most in-depth conversation for each section. Like sometimes some characters are just like, hi, you know, it doesn't actually tell you anything. And then other characters, meanwhile, have a whole paragraph where they're talking about stuff back and forth with somebody else. So those are the kind of the conversations that I really want to show. Um, in particular, the ones I think are interesting is Magus. I'm going to try and show all the combinations that give Magus the most dialogue moving forward. And part of the reason for that is because it's the most rare. Because as I explained a little bit ago, is that um, his conversation will actually be overridden by other characters. Of the different characters you can have in your party, typically Magus has the lowest priority. So he actually has the least dialogue in the game. Um, or rather, is a very high chance that you will miss out on potential things that he could say. So I'm going to be showing that for the walkthrough in general because um, it's unlikely that a lot of you have read a lot of these things. So real quick, I am introducing Ayla and Magus to Specchio so you can see his dialogue for this, which is kind of fun. So he's explaining that Ayla was born before she had the necessary genes to learn magic, so she's not capable of doing that. Then meanwhile, Magus has already learned magic, so there's nothing that um, Specchio can teach him. So that's all interesting. He explains that Magus is shadow element. Um, also, fun fact, Ayla, even though it doesn't say that she's fire, she is actually fire element, so she takes reduced damage from fire, even though she can't use any fire spells. Now, a quick comment, too, about Specchio's dialogue here is his dialogue is very different depending on which version of the game you're currently playing, and this there's various reasons for this, but I'll talk more about that later. So, real quick, as far as equipment, if you want to have different items for all these different characters, uh, for Ayla, I would recommend either the uh, magic ring to increase her damage of her magic attacks, which is basically just going to be Inferno. Otherwise, the barrier ring slash um, wall ring would be a really good item for her, because it can significantly reduce the damage she takes. Now, as far as a lot of the other characters, I'd recommend speed on both Luca and Marl, and honestly, you can do enough damage for this guy that you can probably kill him in just a few turns if you use some really hard-hitting dual techs or even triple techs, so I wouldn't worry too much about the MP cost of everything, so I wouldn't bother with a gold stud. It's just not worth it. Now, as far as your chest piece, you should totally have on either the red, blue, or white chest piece. I don't think he actually even does any shadow damage at all, so you're pretty much just using uh, one of those three. There's kind of two trains of thought for the defensive items. You can either have like a different color plate for each character, so have like red plate, blue plate, and then ideally white plate, I think. I'm not even sure if he does shadow damage. I don't think he does. I think he just does lightning damage, so black plate would be worthless, so you want to give him white plate or something instead. Um, so that's one way you can do that, because if you have a different element for each character, then what that means is you're only taking a third of the damage, because if you're you're healing for one element and you're taking damage from two of the elements, that means your total damage taken is actually going to only be one third of all the damage that he can do. So that's a pretty sweet thing. Another thing you can do too is I did charm a whole bunch of barriers from enemies in the Ocean Palace. So you could start the battle with Specchio because he only does magic damage. If you have every single character, as soon as they start, they immediately use a barrier sphere, the very first thing, then you reduce all the damage you take by a lot. And that can be a pretty nice thing as well. You should also totally have the Mermaid Helm and the Dark Helm on one of your characters if you have the option. The Dark Helm is only available on guys. The Mermaid Helm can be worn by anyone, but those will reduce um, shadow damage and water damage by 50%, which is really great. So you should totally have that on one of your characters too, just to reduce it even further. Another thing you can potentially do is do like uh, the red ar or the red plate, the red vest, and like a ruby vest, and then that way you can reduce just fire damage. So that way, like whenever there's fire damage, you can just ignore everything and just go hard for damage. And then if he's using one of the other elements, you can focus on healing. So that's one way you can do that. Now, as far as good text you can use, one fun one you can do is between Luca and Ayla, they have Inferno. If, as long as you pump a bunch of magic into Ayla, that's a really hard hitting ability. Just so you know, a lot of um, a lot of the texts we have in the game are like half physical half magical like for example i'm using ice cube toss between ayla and marl right now now this is mostly based off of ayla's physical damage actually but specchio is very resistant to physical so that ability doesn't do very much damage to him so you're better off using abilities that are straight up magic now abilities that are straight up magic is things like inferno um, antipode bomb 3 is a really good one 
Um, there's not really too many other, like, there's, we have, like, Ice Tackle, for example, is physical, magical, so there's a lot of abilities that have, like, a mixture of both. So, Marl and, and Luca are definitely the both, both some of the, like, really good, uh, magic damage dealers. Another one you can do right now is actually to use, um, Magus, although if you don't have a lot of experience on him, he probably only has, like, Lightning 2, Ice 2, and Fire 2, which aren't all that great. I would say that Antifoot Bomb 3 is actually one of the hardest-hitting, solid magic abilities we have in the game. It hits really, really hard, does a really great job. It's very expensive for Luca, but as long as you have enough capacity to get through combat anyways, it's not really that big a deal. So you can see I got through combat pretty easily here. One of the biggest things, too, by the way, that made this doable is the fact that I have a lot of speed. I gave a lot of speed to both these characters, and I also have speed items on my girls, so they are very, very quick, which means that Marl can heal everybody pretty fast and easily. So once you've defeated him, he will then give you a whole bunch of ethers and a magic tab as well. So next, as long as we're here in the end of time, I'm going to check up on my monster and stuff in the Arena of Ages, and sure enough, I have now unlocked Tier 6. Now, apparently this was locked because of my character level is why this wasn't available yet. Now, Tier 6 six, just so you know. The rewards for this is all of the types of items that you find kind of in this last whole stretch of the game. So some of the really the best items you can get from the side quests and also items you can unlock in the Black Omen itself. So it's just all the end game items is what's available here in tier six. And you can actually unlock this fairly early in the game, I think. I was thinking originally early in the walkthrough that it was based on your progress through the game. I think it's actually more based on your character level. In fact, I have a recording right here of me showing me swapping Magus back and forth. If I have Ayla as my team leader, then I I have access to tier 6, but if I have Magus, then the I only have access to tier 5. And the reason for this is because I think it's the party leader is what matters. So Ayla's actually level 39 and then Magus is level 37. So I just swapped out to show um, Marl being in the front of the party instead and she's 38, that's why I did that. Um, so I just don't think it's the total party level of everybody in your active party, or your your whole party as all, like all your characters combined. I think it's basically just your party leader for this particular case. It's sort of weird how this game decides, like sometimes for some things it's unlocked based off your whole party, sometimes it's just the party leader. I don't really understand. Regardless, so level 38 is one of the requirements for tier 6. As far as other requirements, you do have to defeat all the bosses in each tier, so just make sure you do that. So if you only see up to tier 3 or whatever, then just make sure you kill all the bosses in each one, and then that should progress you on to the next one. As far as the only other remaining thing, supposedly you need to have your monster upgraded to the appropriate class. So if you evolve them several times, the easiest way to guarantee this happens is send them off to training with a Feral Wrath in their possession, and then that will um, force an evolution, or rather has a very high chance to. Um, I'm not sure actually how many forms there are. I've experienced four forms myself, but I've already spent a lot of time here and I don't really want to spend more time. There might be another form after this. I don't think so though. But regardless, um, so my monster is already pretty strong. I still have not actually gotten any spells at all. I, I send them off to training with some magic items several times, but I never actually learned anything. You have a much higher chance of learning spells if you send them to, you train them in antiquity, 12,000 BC. I unlocked it, but I never actually trained with them because my monster was already good enough. And right now, I actually did all of tier 6, killed all of them, destroyed all the bosses really easily, and I still don't have a single spell, and my magic and magic defense are still very low. So, I don't know. <laughs> I already got all the prizes, so who cares, I guess. Like I was saying at the beginning of the walkthrough, though, I was trying to dive into this and really kind of figure it all out for you guys, but it's also, like, so time-consuming, and it's spanned over the course of a very large game, so I'm not sure exactly on the requirements. Like, I, one of the requirements might be that it's gated by quest, so, like, how far you are in the main storyline is part of what determines it, because, like, like for example, right now, I just got to the point where I'm starting to do the end game side quest to give a bunch of good items, and so Tier 6 was unlocked at the exact same time, and everything in Tier 6 is the same items from those those very same side quests. So literally, as soon as the side quests are unlocked is when tier six was unlocked for me too. So I'm not sure if it's gated by quest as well, if that's one of the other requirements or not. I don't really know for sure. I feel like the only way to know for sure would be to restart the game and just like, I don't know, upgrade my monster like crazy and upgrade my characters to get their character level high enough. Because now I know that the tiers are locked by our character level for sure, because I have a recording of it, me showing it. So, um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know the specifics, just get good, I guess. <laughs> So if you look over to the right side of the screen, I have a list of uh, just some of the more notable things that I got in this tier. I'm not listing everything, just some of the more exciting ones in particular. And just some examples so you can kind of get a feel for what's in this tier. Um, as far as consumables too, we get Mega Elixirs here. Those are super rare. That's a, an item that will completely heal your HP and MP for everybody in your entire party which is a very nice item, super rare. I think you can't even get them from, you can charm them off of specific enemies. And I think there's a couple chests in the game and that's it, you can't buy them anywhere or anything. They're just super rare. So the fact that you can even win them here is kind of crazy. Um, so that's great. 
Um, but it's so rare to be able to even find that, so I don't know, it's not like super practical as far as like trying to go out of your way just to get that item, I suppose. Uh, but anyways, as far as other things, I got several different helms. The haste helms, I think, are one of the more valuable ones of those, but I did get like some a clarity cap and stuff like that as well. Haste helms, I think, are overall more valuable, but um, I did also get Angel's Tiara, which is an even more valuable helmet. So that is a female exclusive item, and I think it's only in the Arena of Ages. I don't think you can get it anywhere else. It's definitely not in the Super Nintendo version. I don't think that it's anywhere else in the DS version or PlayStation version or any of those or Steam. I think it's only in the Arena of Ages in the DS version. That's the only place I've ever seen it. Super rare item, but basically it's just a little bit nicer than the Haste Helm. It's a mix between the Haste Helm, the Vigilant Helm, and it also has just a little bit more armor. It's just good. It's definitely best in slot for all the females for sure. Really, really good item. So that's already the best thing ever. So similarly, the best item for females as well is the Prismatic Dress. That's crazy, the fact that you can get those here. So I got a couple of those. So I now have enough Prismatic Dresses to put on all three of my girls, which is uh, really, really good. So that's uh, the highest defense you can get for a chest piece, and it also reduces magic damage automatically because it automatically has the barrier buff. There's a couple other rare things that I got here, like some of those accessories. The Wrath Band is a really good item that I think, um, if you're wanting to counter way better than the Rage Band, just super nice. And there's only one of those in the game defaultly. And likewise, the Prismatic Spectacles are another one of those items where there's only one of them in the entire game. And that also is really, really good. Um, it's actually a really, really good end game. So after you get to like the very end and like you start capping out your stats on characters, or we're, I'm actually really quickly approaching that point too, um, where like some of the characters are gonna get 99 power and they can't go beyond that. Same thing, my girls are gonna start getting 99 magic real quick here. And if I put like a magic ring or a power ring on them, it doesn't do anything because they're already capped. So once you get to that point, um, accessories like the prismatic spectacles start being really, really awesome. Like the magic rings and power rings are, end up being worthless at that point. So you can still like go beyond your regular stat limit by using the prismatic spectacles. And how you, you want to use that, by the way, is you use them on characters that have abilities that have really high MP cost. So for example, let's say Antipode Bomb 3. That costs 20 MP for Luca because it's based on her flare ability, and then it's 8 MP for Marl because it's based on her um, Ice 2. So uh, what that means is that a higher percentage of the damage is actually coming from Luca. So if you put the prismatic spectacles on her, you will increase the damage by like another whole thousand or something. It increases it by quite a bit. So instead of doing like 2,300 or something, you do more like 3,400 or something like that. So it increases it by quite a bit. So anyways, yes, prismatic spectacles, awesome item. Also in this tier is like a bunch of other potions slash tonics and ethers. They're all kind of like mid mid ethers all the way up to high ethers kind of. So it's just all those and the mega elixir of course. But uh, you can also get elixirs here. That's another point I guess. You can get regular elixirs here as well. Um, and then as far as weapons too, by the way. So a lot of these weapons are actually available for purchase from the new that's in the Surviving Village. That guy, his stock changes as the game progresses. So when you first arrive in Surviving Village, he has some stuff after you get the Black Omen, then some stuff changes. And I think after even doing Chrono side quests, then the stock changes again. But anyways, um, he offers some weapons there for sale that, that change as the game progresses. And so the Shockwave is one of those, for example. Um, I'm gonna be getting an upgrade for Luca for that here very shortly, actually, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but that's just one of the items that's there. One of the other ones that's kind of weird is all of Magus's items are available there. So so all of the like the Raven gear and the Gloom gear are available there. The Gloom ones are an upgrade, that's fine. We're gonna get those from Magus's side quest anyways. But the Raven stuff is strange to me because he already starts out with the Raven gear. That's what he starts out with, and nobody else can wear it anyways. So like, there's literally, it's just totally worthless to even have as a prize. I don't really even understand. You just sell them because they're literally duplicates. You can't do anything with them. So I'm not even sure why they have them as a prize. As far as other things I won, you know, just the, all of the consumables, all of them consumables, a whole bunch of elixirs, a whole bunch of mid ethers especially, and some lapis, a whole bunch of barrier spheres actually, which I don't really particularly need those because I charmed a whole bunch earlier. And then otherwise, just in the arena ages in general, you get a whole bunch of capsules, just one of the things you get. Also, another thing that I did win here, which is just um, arena of ages item in general, you can get this in any tier actually, but I got the Eresian Mirror, which is a super rare physical only counter that's only wearable by Robo and Ayla, absolutely terrible item. The Wrath Band is just so much better. 80% chance you can wear it on anybody as opposed to 25% chance optionally and only for those characters. It's just bad. The mirrors are terrible, but if you are trying to 100%, then yeah, that's going to be one of the things you're going to be looking for, I guess. But yeah, from a pure like battle standpoint, it's just such a bad item. So at long last, we're finally ready to continue on with the main quest or side quest. Like technically, you don't have to save Chrono at all. In fact, you don't have to do any of these side quests at the end of the game. You could just go straight to the fighting Lavos and that's it. Um, although, of course, the more good things you do, then the better your ending is going to be. And saving Chrono is definitely one of those things. Uh, but that all being said, 
said, though, because you can fight Lavos at any point in the game, honestly, you can fight him in a whole bunch of different variety of ways. You can crash the epic, you can take the bucket, you can go to the Black Omen, you can use the telepad. Like, you actually have a variety of different ways to fight Lavos at different points in the game. So technically, you could make by that argument, you could say that the whole game is a side quest. In fact, in New Game Plus, you can fight Lavos right at the beginning of the Millennial Fair with just Chrono and Marl. In fact, you could do it just with Chrono, which is uh, kind of nuts, actually. So anyway, continuing on with main quest, you want to go over to Chrono's house here in 1000 AD and speak with his mother, and the characters that will prioritize for this conversation is Luca, followed by Robo, and then finally Ayla is who it will prioritize. Now, between all those, I think the most enjoyable conversation is Luca. It's definitely the most uh, heart-wrenching, like she's his childhood friend and everything, but yeah, it just uh, gets you right in the feelies every time. You heard me. Right. In. The. Feelies. So our party decides not to actually reveal anything to her at this exact time and just pretend like everything's fine and he'll be back soon, which is true and everything, but it's still kind of horrible. So anyways, we're going to continue on and leave. Now, if you did not get a clone with me earlier in the Millennial Fair here, I'm going to show the recording of when I actually did that with Marl earlier in the game. So here is how you do that. And the conversation here with Norstein Beckler will be a little bit different if you um, do it at this point in the game and not back at this point. This recording is back when I did it at the beginning of the game. But so the conversation will be slightly different. I'm actually not sure off the top of my head if he even charges you silver points at this point. I think he just lets you do it. Anyway, if you need silver points, just go kill Gatto several times. He's over on the far left, you know, at the north part of the Millennial Fair and then over on the far left. You can just fight him several times. Just keep walking back and forth on that screen and kill him repeatedly. He gives you 15 silver points every time and you one-shot him at this point, so you'll easily be able to get 40 points so you can play the copycat game here at the Tent of Horrors. But you just want to play the 40-point copycat one, and it'll let you do it with Chrono's doll even if Chrono isn't actually in your party. De defaultly, this is whoever the leader of your party is. It's their doppelganger is the one that you'll be doing this against, or whatever. So all you have to do is press the L, R, the Y, and A buttons to the appropriate action. And one comment about this, though, too, is that um, the clone will do in action and then Norstein Beckler will jump and then you need to press the button. If you do it too soon, it won't actually take the input. So just something to be aware of. Um, you might have to kind of like button mash it until it accepts the command. So just something to be aware of. So again, Norstein Beckler's conversation will be slightly different. He'll have different dialogue if you're here later in the game, but it's basically the exact same process. So that is how you do that. So if you either get a clone from Chrono's house, if you won one earlier, or go to the Millennial Fair and win one right now. So once you have a clone in hand, go to 2300 AD and head over to... Uh, Africa, I guess it would be. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the bottom left is supposed to be. Is that supposed to be Hawaii or is that supposed to be just South America just like woo, hanging out with Antarctica? I don't know what's going on. Anyway, so we want to head to Keeper's Dome here in Africa. Now, as long as we're here, I'm going to show that you can use this console to rename the epic whenever you want, which is kind of fun. Uh, we weren't able to do that before. Also, by the way, you can speak with a new in uh, 65 million BC in Luruba Ruins in order to rename your characters as well, by the way. Anyway, to continue on, just enter through the door to the north and go back back through the room where we got the messages from the Guru of Reason earlier, and there is a magic capsule on the ground here that is only here after you have gotten the epic for the first time. So you could have actually gone back through here and I showed a recording of me getting that earlier on the walkthrough. But yeah, if you did not get that magic tab before, now is a great time to do so. Anyways, um, Gasper, the Guru of Time, who was the old man in the, old, in the end of time, told us that we need to seek out Balthazar, the Guru of Reason, who would give us a, a tip on how to bring the dead back to life. So, now remember that Balthazar kicked the bucket, he's no longer around, however, he did upload his memories to the new here. So this new says that you can do so by going to Death Peak, which is nearby, and that's where, like, all the lava spawns are, they're nasty little things. I'm assuming it's because Lavos is nearby and reality is all twisted around him and stuff like that is why this is the case. But anyways, so Death Peak is our destination. Destination. But in order to do so, he says we're going to need two things, one of which is a clone that is identical to the person we're trying to resurrect in every way. So that's the that's how you knew you were supposed to go uh, back to um, Norstein Beckler's lab and get a clone for Chrono. Is it's kind of the reminder for that. So that's how you got the clue we needed to do that. So if you don't have a cl clone, he's going to be like, hey, come back once you have a clone, man. Um, so that's why I just took care of that step first. The next thing we need for our journey is obviously elemental Poyoza dolls, which is exactly what you're expecting. So we now have a total of four dolls that are going to help us save the day, which makes total sense to me. I, I swear, guys, we, in the last five minutes, we've gotten the most useful stuffed animals in history. But I suppose if you're the guru of reason and you're stuck in the future with no one to talk to, what else are you going to do as you're slowly going insane but invent technologically advanced teddy bears, right? At this point, Belthanu has a final request for us. He wants us to press the switch on his stomach, which will deactivate him forever. New murder. Just feels icky. Like, I don't know. I mean, Belthazar, like, I just feel sad for him all the time. It's like, every time I've interacted with him, something bad's happening to him. He's, like, going crazy, and, and then he's dead, and then he's a new, and he's kind of alive. Oh, happy day, and then he's dead again or something. And then he's, like, talking to us again, and then we, we really 
kill him at that point. I shall now call him the Guru of Unreasonable. I swear, Balthazar is such a tease, like dying and coming back to life repeatedly. It's, you know, the funny thing about that is he doesn't do it anywhere near as much as most comic book heroes out there, right? You know, and at least our heroes don't do that at all. Except for Chrono. Right. So, as per his instructions, we're next heading over to Death Peak, which is just to the, like, top right of where Keeper's Dome is. So, the first Poyoza Tree doll thing, you want to activate it and then go over to the right. There is a strength capsule that is over here on the right. I actually grabbed it earlier in the game, so if you did not grab that yet, be sure to do it now. Now, as far as these trees go, you do have to, like, position yourself just perfect right in the middle of them and then walk right against them to avoid the blowing wind is how you do this. However, it is really awkward. Like, I don't know, man. Seriously, you got to get it just perfect. If you're just, like, a little bit off center at all, it doesn't work. And then you'll blow down the mountain so it's super annoying it will probably take you several tries but don't worry about it too much like if you're experiencing some struggles here that's pretty normal so one of the things that's happened throughout this walkthrough is i've used chrono luca marl and ayla the most so they're the ones who have earned the most tp so uh, chrono luca and marl have learned all of their techs for the entire game so they've already learned everything uh, that they have access to for their single text. So meanwhile, um, Ayla has just a little bit more TP to go. She's almost there. And then meanwhile, Robo and Frog need quite a bit. Also, Magus needs the most by far. I just got him. I haven't even used him yet, but he needs quite a bit of TP. So what I'm going to try and do for the remaining parts of the game is I'll use Ayla a little, a little bit, especially on bosses, and that won't take long at all to finish her off. But meanwhile, the other three characters, I'm going to try and use them as much as possible for these following side quests to try and get them to learn the remaining abilities. So I would highly encourage you to do the same. Whatever category, whatever characters they are, you can tell by just seeing which uh, techs are grayed out in the single tech list. And there is uh, charts online so you can see like where they are because it doesn't show all of their unavailable text yet. It just shows the next one they have to unlock. So those are a little bit confusing that way. Uh, so next what I'm doing is I'm moving those characters over to my party and I'm going to swap out some items for Magus because I have some better ones. In particular, uh, Shala's amulet. I don't really need that right now. That is a an item that gives you status immunity, which is actually something you really need for some bosses, but most of the time it doesn't really matter. So um, for right now, I'm actually going to swap that out for a better item. So I spent a good deal of time talking about Magus from a lore standpoint in the previous video, and that was super fascinating. I think it's really cool. Um, but I, one thing I haven't been able to talk about yet is him from a combat standpoint. Now he actually has some very, he has a very interesting toolkit. His playstyle is very unique, uh, very different than all the characters we've played so far. And I just think it's really fascinating that the development team was able to come up with characters that all like fill different niches so well. Anyways, what Magus's whole theme is is that he doesn't play nice with others, and this is definitely um, shown in the mechanics because, for example, he has no dual techs at all. However, his single techs are really nice. He has very high stats, and the damage on all the abilities he has, the multiplier for his abilities, tends to be higher than everybody else. So, like most characters, using a dual tech is just better. Magus is sort of in this weird sweet spot in between where his single techs are better than other people's single techs, but other people's dual techs are better than his single techs. Does that make sense? So, like, normally, like, at this point, a lot of people's single techs are just not very good or they're very expensive. Magus, on the other hand, can do some pretty cheap single techs, honestly, for the... Yeah, the amount of damage you get out of it per MP spent is actually very high for him. So he's a really great character for that. Also, he tends to focus on full screen clear, so he has a lot of abilities that hit everything on the screen, and he hits really hard. So, um, but it just kind of depends on what kind of enemy you're fighting. At the very least, you can whittle him down. But, like, for example, I just used Ice 2. Just so you know, that has a higher multiplier than Mar Marl's Ice 2. So not only is Magus' stats higher, he has really high stats, the highest stats of any character in the game, but... Um, he so not only does he hit harder because of that but he hits harder because the ability itself has a higher multiplier so that all being said if you're going to bring somebody if you're going to use um, abilities that are in that tier so the fire to ice to lightning to whatever you're gonna, if you're going to use one of those to try and do full screen clear to kill trash like this then i would recommend you actually bring magus because he d just hits a little bit harder um so at this point in the game it's actually kind of nice because you can get through this whole area just use all of magus's mp and then switch to other characters for the boss would be a better option so uh, that's a pretty cool thing just so you know too by the way if you're going to use one of those abilities you're usually best off using fire too because um enemies are typically not as resistant there's less pe less enemies that are resistant to fire than any other element in the game generally speaking at least at this point in the game there's actually some enemies earlier in the game that are vulnerable to shadow and stuff too but um point being there are less enemies that have resistance to fire than any other elements, so it, you're more likely for it to be successful if you're using Fire 2 instead of Lightning 2 and Ice 2. I think the reason for this is just to incentivize using Luca a little bit more because, like, you know, we have most of the game, we have Chrono in our slot and he can't move, right? So we have, we have Lightning all the time. And then meanwhile, we have two 
water user. So then meanwhile, Luca is the only fire user. So Magus can use everything, but he's not specifically fire. But point being that there's more enemies that are vulnerable to fire because they want to make Luca a more viable option. So anyways, if you're going to be killing trash like this, then I would recommend that you use Magus uh, and have him use fire specifically. So in this next room up ahead, we have our first boss. So after you have gone to the save point, you want to go ahead and save there and open up the nearby chest, get some goodies, and then run in here once you have your appropriate party that you want. In my case, I'm actually just trying to get as much TP as possible. So I did swap out for Ayla though. Uh, Robo needs a little bit more TP than Frog does though in my particular case. So what you want to do is charm the head to get an elixir and then you want to use single target abilities. I'd recommend you have either Frog or Robo with you so you can use Heal Beam or Star Heal to heal after the boss uses Lavos Spawn Needle, which is a really nasty ability that hits all your characters for a lot of physical damage. So put on as much physical resistance as you can. If you really want to, you can also throw on like a Guardian Helm. One of your characters would help a lot. Whoever has the lowest stamina, the lowest physical resist. So the boss has that nasty needle attack, which hurts really, really bad. And that is on a long cooldown, so it will happen again, but it's very, very slow. But otherwise, the boss will actually counter with that every time you hit the shell. So because of that, you want to avoid multi-target attacks. Anything that hits the whole screen is bad. So basically, Magus is terrible for this fight. I am using him because the boss is pretty easy, and I want a bunch of TP. Bosses give a ton of TP, by the way, so I want to actually have him in this battle for that exact reason. Now, he does actually have a few other attacks. They're not too bad. He does have Mega Bomb, which that hits really hard. Um, however, it just hits one character. Now, if you can, throw some red plate on some of your characters, and you can avoid a lot of damage this way. In this particular case, he hit Ayla, and she happened to be wearing the red plate, so it healed her instead. One thing that's kind of fun about this boss is it drops an elixir, too. So I charmed one off the head, but I also got an elixir for defeating it as well, which is pretty cool. I'm assuming, actually, what that probably is is that the boss, uh, that the shell drops one, but the head charms one. So anyways, just cool that you can actually get two from that particular fight. Those are super rare. Besides all that, I need a little TP on Ayla anyway, so I'm not really too worried about it. I'll get the ability unlocked here just a little bit. I only need 200 TP, and I'm not sure how much of those bosses give me a lot, though. So, anyways, moving on. You want to continue on through the north, and there is a combat here in the middle. You can avoid it by just hugging the north wall if you want to. Now, by the way, these macabres, whatever, they also, you can charm uh, just regular ethers off them, which is terrible at this point. Regular ethers are garbage, so I wouldn't even bother with those. So I'm just killing them all again. Fire is the thing that all these enemies are the most um, vulnerable to, just in general, or rather the most number of enemies are vulnerable to fire, just generally speaking. Uh, I think part of the reason for that too, by the way, is it's not guaranteed that you're even going to have Magus, so that would mean if you did end up killing Magus, then it would mean that Luca is the only one who can do fire damage, and they just want to make sure that she's not like... I don't know, just unable to do anything in most situations. If she had, like, just as many resistances as everybody else, it'd be a little annoying. So it just makes her a little more viable of an option in most situations. Now, this next area, you can grab an upgrade for Frog pretty good. If you hug the right wall, you can avoid this combat as well. But otherwise, you go to the middle, you can kill all these guys. I'd recommend you kill them all just because free XP, especially if you're going to be upgrading Magus. Um, or just whoever characters you have left. If you use a character that has some good screen clear, and then have your other characters in your party that are characters that still need TP, then I'd recommend you use that method to level them up and learn them abilities as fast as possible. So once you're done in this area, go outside and you'll see there's a sparkly off to the left, and you want to interact with it. This will open up a nearby cave in the area below, which is back where we came from. This is back where the save spot was, like right before the lava spawn bottle battle, so you can totally do that. Again, go back north, hug the right wall to avoid that combat, and once again in this area you can hug the north wall to avoid this combat as well. Otherwise, you can go ahead and do it if you want to to get some free XP. Now, I do think that, like, kind of from this point onward in the game, it's just using full screen clear, as long as you can do enough damage to pull it off in one shot, like, it's just the way to go, because this is the fastest way to get XP for all these areas. Like, just kill all the trash this way, it's just so nice. Once you've made it back to the save point, you can use a shelter if you want to, go ahead and save, and then go through the cave that we opened up above just a little bit ago. This is this middle area, you can grab the goodies in the chest nearby, and then this enemy here, you can just totally avoid them if you want to, but otherwise you can fight them if you would like. Now, this actually has an upgrade for Magus, which is a pretty nice... Uh, sickle upgrade for right now, and there is actually better sickles that we'll be getting later, although it's kind of weird. At this point in the game, the game forks off even more. You know how, like, when we got, like, access to the end of time and we could go through all the time periods, it was like the game kind of opened up? Well, that kind of happened again, where there's a whole bunch of quests and side quests you can do at this point that are, like, you can go anywhere you want, basically. There's all kinds of stuff you can do, and they're all really good. So depending on the order of events, you'll, like, get different upgrades and stuff. Now, once you exit this next doorway, you will initiate combat. So I'd recommend you switch to whatever team composition you want. Again, in my case, I'm going to use Ayla because I want to charm the head so that I can get an extra elixir. And then meanwhile, I'm going to go ahead and just single target down the beak because it doesn't really matter. And the, the head's pretty easy to kill. Again, Magus is a terrible person for this combat, but it, bosses give a lot of TP, and I'm trying to give the most TP to him in particular. 
But yeah, these lava spawn battles are all the same. There's three of them here on Death Peak, and so here's the second one. Um, now, as a quick comment, as far as abilities you can use for this boss, unfortunately, a lot of our good single techs are involve Chrono. Chrono is involved in the most dual techs and triple techs in the entire game, and we don't have access to him right now, so it makes our options a little bit more limited. Now, as far as good single techs you can use on him, just or any good dual techs, we have, like, a lot of them are combinations between Luca or Marl and one of the other characters, so, like, Robo, Frog, and Ayla. So if you have, like, uh, you can do Fire Punch or Ice Tackle, or you can use Flame Kick, or you have, uh, like, Bubble Bomb, or not Bubble Bomb, but uh, Bubble Breath, and... Oh, I don't know, there's a couple other ones, but they're all like things like that, where they're... A lot of them are physical type, is all those single tech... Uh, single target abilities are typically physical. So one of the, some of the best ones actually are single techs that are like Ayla just learned triple kick, for example. That's a really good single tech as well that's physical. It's really good. And then otherwise Frog has Aerial Strike, otherwise known as Leap Slash. And that's a pretty good ability too. So here we have a Poyoza doll that says this area is extra icy and you got to be careful because if you fall, you'll have to start over again. What this means is that the wind will blow us south and if you touch the bottom ledge at all, you'll then fall down and appear back at the save point. So you have to work your way back up. I'm going to skip over all my travel time there and just show me completing it again. So all you have to do is just keep pressing up on the D-pad. It's not that hard. Work your way over to the left. And here, it's windy as well, but it doesn't blow us, but the enemies are blowing through here all the time. So what you want to do is, I would actually recommend you do kill them on purpose, because it's just a lot of free XP. Honestly, you can kind of hang out here. This is a great place, because you don't have to, like, walk back and forth to get off the screen and come back at all either. You can just sit here and then just kind of move a little bit. But again, remember, if you're holding still, enemies will pass right through you. Otherwise, if you're moving and you touch them, that's what actually causes combat. So anyways, you just sit here for a little bit and then just kind of wiggle the D-pad a little bit. Then you'll initiate combat again, and it's great. So I feel like overall there is four different times when Magus is super useful. So first of all is the fact that he even has the shadow element because like Robo has shadow, but it's just not very good. One thing I think is sad is we don't really have a single target shadow ability. I wish we had just one, like some kind of dark arrow or something. We could just be like, bam, hit somebody would be really cool. But I guess I understand why they don't want Magus specifically to have that. But anyways, um, the second reason to have Magus is the fact that he's got elemental versatility. Like he would have been super cool in the Ocean Palace, you know what I mean? Like, just you just bring him and then it just completes everything. Of course, they give him to us right after that. You know, now we understand how useful that can possibly be, I suppose. And the third reason is the fact that because he hits everything, um, he's really good at taking out trash. So I would say he is the garbage man character but by far. And the fourth reason is he's a really nice character for your final slot. If you're not character, you don't know what to do. You have two characters that are de dedicated to doing like your. Uh, your, whatever your dual tech you're trying to do, Magus can fill that final slot pretty well, and that's another potential option for him. But yeah, I would say definitely the most useful thing for him by far is the fact that he's uh, good at taking out the trash. So yes, I would say he's your garbage character, and I mean that in the best way possible. So go over to the far left, and there is a like a ladder thing you can climb down, these rocks, and down here you'll find a chest containing a dark helm, which is a super useful thing. It's a helmet that will reduce incoming shadow damage by 50%. Very nice. You can only wear it by dudes, unfortunately, so the girls can't wear it, but very cool item should have and then you could go ahead and use a shelter at the nearby save point and save here and here we have the final lava spawn battle so once again get your party the way you want once again i'm gonna have ayla in my party so i can charm the head so that i can get an additional elixir you know funnily enough the da most dangerous thing with this boss is actually just accidentally hitting the shell so as long as you're not like in too much of a rush you should be totally fine it's not really that big a deal um also something else to know is you don't have to heal with like i'm using robo's heal beam every time you know because every time he uses this needle attack, I'm just using that immediately because it's just not worth risking it. So here I decided I was just going to ignore it. I'm just going to rush the boss down. It'll be great. Uh, unfortunately, I did accidentally hit the shell later with Magus, and it got really scary really fast. Um, so I did end up using a heal. But again, the boss was so close to dead at that point, he only has 4,000 life. And in fact, with this particular team composition, I have actually already unlocked uh, Rapid Fire Fist, otherwise known as Uzi Punch, as well as Triple Kick. Now, if I had Frog in that last slot instead, so instead of Magus, I had Frog and he was using Aerial Strike, otherwise known as Leap Slash, then what would happen is I could totally, like, I'd probably do over a thousand damage with each character to the boss's head, and he only has 4,000 life, so it doesn't take long. So yeah, like as, like you saw there, I accidentally hit him with, uh, with Magus, and I started queuing up a heal with Robo as soon as I saw that, because I was like, oh no! And it's actually a good thing I did because the boss immediately followed up with a Mega Bomb on Magus as well. And this is what I was talking about. Like, if you don't heal, it can get pretty scary really fast, but the boss doesn't have very much life left. I do actually really think that using techs in general is smarter for this boss battle because, um, you know, if I'm using weight anyways as my battle type, then what that means is that I can go ahead and, uh, like, 
like it's almost paused, so I can access, I can like move to the head easier and select it more carefully without having to worry about trying to rush through it because of my action gauges with my other stuff. Also, it just means I have to worry less about his other attacks and stuff too. I guess all I'm really trying to say is that battles where you have to carefully select your target, I think weight makes it significantly easier for that. Now, the last Poyoza doll we, we met, I didn't have a chance to talk about this, it was a saying you should push the lava shell is how you proceed. So, you want to move this particular shell. This particular one doesn't disintegrate after you defeat that lava spawn for some reason. You want to push it over to the far right and then use it to climb up the nearby rocks on the wall here. Now up ahead we actually have a cinematic and you have different conversations depending on which characters you have in your party. Now the conversations that I think are overall have the most enjoyable dialogue is going to be Marl, Luca, and Magus. So next, real quick before we move on with the rest of the game, I want to show some quick alternative character interactions that are available depending on which characters you have in your party. Um, these are kind of rare. Some of these you might not even see because you have to have very specific character combinations in order to make them appear. Most of the dialogue for these scenes actually is the exact same for all combinations. I'm going to skip over those because it's literally the exact same dialogue. I'm only going to show the dialogue that's actually different just so you can see some of the alternatives that could have been if you had chosen a different uh, set of characters. So what the game does for all these kind of scenes is it always like moves the characters around for the dialogue depending on their priority list. So like, uh, you know, if you have Marl in your 
party at all. She will always take top priority and then she will be the person initiating most of the stuff. Meanwhile, Luca will move to slot number two and she'll be the helper person. Meanwhile, uh, somebody of a lower priority will always be the third slot. So anyways, the list of priorities is going to be Marl, Luca, Frog, and then Ayla, Robo, and then finally Magus last. Magus is actually the hardest one to get him to even say anything. That's also the reason why I'm trying to use uh, Magus as much as possible for a lot of the scenes like this. Now, as far as Luca's interactions, I feel like she's kind of fun because she's kind of like, Baka! <laughs> Basically, I mean, I realize it's not in Japanese, but I'm sure that's what's going on right now. So a slightly more rare primary speaker is going to be Frog. In order to accomplish this, you can't have Marl or Luca in your party, and then he will be the uh, main bro instead. One of the things I think is kind of strange about this, though, is that um, Frog tends to end up being the helper person, the person in the second speaking position, whom that's the person who is like, well, sorry, bro, it just isn't going to work out. But then meanwhile, when Frog switches to the leadership position, then now he suddenly he is like the person being like, Chrono, speak to us, whatever. It's almost like he swapped roles entirely. So I can almost like kind of kills the immersion for me a little bit because like literally the characters are saying the opposite of what they did the last time so it feels a little bit strange for some of these later combinations i'd say overall i like the idea of having marl hug chrono just because there's the whole implied romance thing and everything and just like it just it's just good i think chrono deserves a little snuggle time but i will say i like this uh this scene really a lot especially i like the one line from frog where he's saying you lucky lucky fool you lucky mute fool <laughs> but in all seriousness i i seriously get the feeling like he's almost i realize it's just text but i always feel like he's crying in this scene you know what i mean he's just like oh i'm so glad to have you back and it just like feels equally emotional but in a real a real manly bro sense like frog is such a bro man like go glenn team glenn <laughs> Now this all begs the question, what is the most rare scene that most people will probably never see? And that is this one right here, because you can only get this scene if you have the combination of Ayla, Magus, and Robo. Now what that'll do is it puts Robo in the primary speaking position. Unfortunately, a lot of his dialogue is actually the exact same, literally, as what Frog says. The only part that's different is when Chrono wakes up, then he has slightly different dialogue, which is extremely short, way shorter than the other ones. And it's pretty much non-existent, and it's also kind of boring. I find this super sad. Like it's the hard it's like the hardest one to get out of this whole thing and it's like it's not uh, very exciting at all. And I whined about this early in the walkthrough, but I feel like a lot of the the dialogue lines that Robo has in this game are kind of boring most of the time. They're just not very inspired or they're kind of like meh. And I feel like they have potential to be a lot cooler. And I realize that's it's kind of a fine line to walk. You got to keep them more robotic and like, you know, stoic kind of and like very analytical, but at the same time like to make him do actions that provoke emotions and usually that's to make him seem personified make him seem human or like try and try and do human things and then it fails horribly whatever that's there's humor in that or something i don't know so for that scene i'm not really entirely sure what it would be i'm assuming that scene is all about the emotional thing of having chrono back and the other ones are a little bit more like makes you feel empathetic for the characters or something they're they're showing the fact that they're really glad that Chrono, chrono's back so i'm not really sure what robo could do in that particular scene i mean one simple way would be for just for him to make an observation about everybody else's emotions you know he could say like you know i don't really understand all these things i don't understand human emotions i don't actually understand how this all fits together but i can tell you from my ana analysis that you complete us and i am so glad that you are back you know even just saying that is like really deep and profound from a robotic standpoint. I think the way he presented it could be kind of interesting. But what do you guys think? What do you think would be cool dialogue for Robo to have? Let me know in the comments. I'm interested to see what ideas you guys have. So that actually completes Chrono's side quest. And at this point, we now have access to all of the other characters' side quests. There's a whole bunch of other side quests. Most of them are related to a particular character. So you can, in fact, speak to them here at the end of time to get a clue about the side quest that is related to that character. So that's what we're going to be doing in the following videos. So as always, thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this and found it helpful, be sure to throw a like on it, subscribe, and stay tuned for more content just like this. As always, stay awesome, have an amazing day, and I'll see you next time.